Well, if you've been watching, uh, we ventured through Daniel when the pandemic began, and then we went right into the book of Revelation. And we have finished the book of Revelation. We made it through all 22 chapters. And tonight, what I thought we would do is to go back and do what I'm calling Prophecy in Review. Prophecy in Review, which is the title of tonight's lesson. I think lesson is really the best word to use because it's probably not going to be as much a sermon as it is just that, a lesson. And so as we begin this Prophecy in Review, I, I want to remind everyone that the book of Daniel from the section of the major prophets of the Old Testament is the key to understanding Bible prophecy. We know from studying the book that Daniel was a Jew living in exile in Babylonia, and the book which he penned contains prophetic messages that were revealed to him in visions. Uh, some of the messages were revealed to someone else in visions, but Daniel interpreted for them because of this supernatural gift God gave him to discern the meaning of dreams and visions. He was God's appointed man in that appointed time. And in the second chapter of, of Daniel, the Bible records that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, who had led the Babylonian armies to conquer the Jewish people, and to completely plunder and destroy the holy city of Jerusalem and to take the Jewish people as exiles into Babylonia. Nebuchadnezzar had a very disturbing dream and none of his magicians and astrologers and paid dream interpreters were able to make sense of the dream. But God used Daniel, this Jewish exile in the land of Babylonia, to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And what I want to do is to go back tonight and just we're going to walk through a few slides that I want to display from our study in Daniel to kind of recap the, in particular, two visions which Daniel was able to interpret. One of them was a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, which Daniel interpreted for him, and the other was a vision that Daniel himself had. One from Daniel 2, one from Daniel 7. And we're going to walk through this as a, as a way of review, but it will have special significance on our overview of Revelation in just a moment. So we'll walk through these slides one at a time, and all of these slides are borrowed from our original messages through Daniel back in 2020. So if you'll remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he saw this warrior. And what we did was we laid the warrior down on its side to help us interpret it as in terms of linear time because this warrior represented successive kingdoms. And we can understand it from a, from a vertical perspective, but we laid this image down as an artist depicted this image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And we understand that each component of this warrior's body is a symbol of a kingdom, beginning with Babylon, whom Daniel said, with God's help, he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold on the warrior you saw in your dream. And then Medo-Persia and then Greece. But what I want us to focus on is Rome because Rome is the legs and feet. So that has special significance for us going forward, as you're going to see. You'll notice at the top of the slide that there is that throne of God. And the reason that we depict that throne above this is because this, is, this was a theme in, in the book of Daniel that God is seated in heaven and he rules and is providential above history that God has ordained the outcome of all things, but that no matter what is going on on planet Earth, whether Babylon is ruling, Persia, Greece, or Rome, God is very much in control no matter what it looks like from Earth's perspective. Now I want you to notice in this second slide how we have separated the feet from the, from the main part of the body of the warrior. And you'll notice there... Rome is the legs, but we have reason to believe that what Daniel could not see is that there would be a gap of time between the ancient Roman Empire, which was prophetically revealed 
to Daniel from Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what we believe is going to be a revived Roman Empire. And you see that written over these detached feet on the, on the warrior image. And the reason that I want you to focus on that is because that the feet have ten toes as, as a normal uh, you know, as normal feet would have, five toes on each foot. And there is a special significance to that number 10, which would be the number of toes on the, on the feet of the warrior. And also because when it was revealed to Daniel, the feet were comprised of clay and iron commingled together. The legs were of iron, but the feet were clay and iron commixed which meant that they, they were not as strong as solid iron and they would be easier crushed than the legs themselves. And in the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, and we're not going to display this on a slide, but in the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, there was this stone that was not made with human hands that came down and crushed the feet and eventually the stone crushed the entire warrior image. And we believe that the stone which was revealed in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the meaning of which was given to Daniel by the Holy Spirit, that stone not made with human hands is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the Messiah is going to come in the last days and crush the feet of ten toes which is this revived Roman Empire. So this is very important for us to grasp when we get into the book of Revelation. Then in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel had a vision of four beasts, and those beasts represented the same four kingdoms that the warrior in Nebuchadnezzar's dream depicted. But the fourth beast, Rome, was, was given to Daniel in this vision, and it was a beast that had no counterpart in the created world. There was no animal counterpart. It was just a horrific sight. And all we can do is surmise what that unspeakable beast looked like. And this is an artist's very simple rendering of it. But this fourth beast represents Rome, just like the legs of iron in the warrior represented Rome. And... What Daniel went on to see is that there was some activity on the head of that fourth beast. So what I want you to do is to look at this next image, and you can see that we have placed this fourth beast from Daniel 7, which depicted Rome. We've situated that right under the iron legs, which we believe foretold the ancient Roman Empire. But we have taken his head from off his body, and we have put the head of this fourth creature right under those feet. And let me explain to you while you look at it. In Daniel's vision in chapter 7 of his prophecy, just as the feet on the warrior image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream had ten toes on it, so the head of the fourth beast in Daniel's dream in chapter 7 had ten horns. And it is from those ten horns that the Antichrist is going to come. If you would, I want you to reverse and display that previous image one more time, the image from uh, Daniel's vision in chapter 7, because I circled that center horn, and you can see the artist has shown that as with a human face and a crown on it. Because according to the dream that Daniel had, this little horn, as it is called in his dream or vision, is going to emerge from among the ten horns. And I just wanted you to see that red circle around what is called in Daniel's dream the little horn. Okay, I just wanted you to see that as frame of reference. So I want you to think with me for a moment about this number ten. That if it is true in how we're interpreting this, that there was an ancient Roman Empire, and we all know there was, even though in Daniel's day, there was no Roman Empire yet. In our day, we're looking back and we know very well there was a Roman Empire. If we're interpreting this correctly, in that Daniel was unable to see this gap between an ancient Roman Empire and then a period of time 
that ensued before a revival of the Roman Empire, there must be something to this number 10 if the feet represent a revival of the Roman Empire in the last days, like the head on the fourth beast in Daniel's dream in chapter 7 has ten horns, we, we have to conclude, and hopefully we're, we're accurate in this, that the Antichrist is going to emerge from among some confederation of either ten leaders or countries that that exist in a revival of the ancient Roman Empire in the last days. Now, the reason that, um, that the, this idea of the little horn that emerges from these ten horns or these ten leaders or ten countries, whatever the case may be, the little horn in Daniel 7 is the Antichrist of the book of Revelation. He's also called the beast in the book of Revelation. And what I wanted you to see, and, and again, I remind you, we're drawing these out of the archive from our Daniel study. I just wanted you to see this, this comparison uh, on the screen between the little horn of Daniel 7, and remember that was the little horn that had the human face with the crown with the red circle that I showed you a moment ago, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast who is revealed in Revelation 13. Notice there that in Daniel 7 and verse 7, the little horn emerges from ten horns. The beast of Revelation 13 has ten horns. The little horn of Daniel 7 in Daniel 7, 3 rises from the sea. And in Revelation 13, verse 1, the beast or Antichrist rises from the sea. He speaks arrogantly in Daniel 7. He speaks arrogantly in Revelation 13. He makes war with the saints in Daniel 7. In Revelation 13, he makes war with the saints. In Daniel 7, he blasphemes God. In Revelation 13, he blasphemes God. So we believe that the little horn of Daniel 7 that emerges from the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast, which is Rome, and we believe the head is a revived Roman Empire, that this is the Antichrist of the last days about whom so much is, is told us in the book of Revelation by John. Now, if you were to step back and say, hmm, the ancient Roman Empire, we know what that looked like, and we, we glean that from history, what might the revival of the Roman Empire look like? And I borrowed this map from a study at Stanford University, and I wanted to display it on the screen for you because this was the Roman Empire, as it says there in 117 AD, at its greatest uh, peak of power. And basically, if you will look at it, all that is in red there, it, it's, it encircles the Mediterranean Sea. So it covers the northern coast of the continent of Africa, and then it reaches over towards uh, Asia, the Middle East, the Holy Land was encompassed by it. We know that Rome had dominion over Israel. And then it ventures westward and northwestward ac across Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And then it moves over into the continent of Europe, and it takes in all the way over into what was called Britannia, which are the modern-day British Isles, and then southwest over towards Spain. That is what the ancient Roman Empire looked like at its peak. Okay, I wanted you to see that because imagine what a revived Roman Empire would look like. And could it be that the last day's confederation of nations from which the Antichrist will emerge will be ten nations or leaders in our time or in a time that we have yet to see from that red area that constituted the ancient Roman Empire. And you know, I've even uh, just so you know, we could we could take weeks talking about this and speculating about it. But bear in mind that it was European settlers who came to America, and even though our land was already inhabited by indigenous peoples, America was founded as a country by Europeans, and. Could it be 
that the United States of America could be considered part of the revived Roman Empire from which the Antichrist will come. Well, these, uh, these kinds of, of curiosities are the making of much imagination and fascination because we simply don't know. But what we do believe is that there will be a revival of the ancient Roman Empire in the last days and that it is from that revived Roman Empire that the Antichrist will come. All right, now, having looked back and, and, and reviewed those things, I want to remind all of us that the most important passage from the book of Daniel that helps us interpret uh, biblical prophecy, and in particular, the book of Revelation, is Daniel chapter, and I wish I could hear you because many of you know it's Daniel chapter 9. If I were relying on you to fill in the blank, you, I know many of you watching know that Daniel 9 is the prophetic key. And in Daniel 9, that is where the angel Gabriel revealed, uttered the words audibly to Daniel, God's prophetic plan and what we also call God's prophetic program for the Jewish people. So what I want to do is read from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It's the first thing that Gabriel said to Daniel about God's program for the Jewish people. He said this, 70 weeks are determined. And I want you to, to, to see where I've inserted there on the screen the, the word sevens. Another way to understand this is 70 sevens are determined for your people. And Daniel's people were the Jewish people. So one of the confusing things about this prophecy that Gabriel gave to Daniel is the word weeks. It throws everybody off, and it threw me off for the longest time. And, the, and I'm going to be honest with you, the first time I really came to understand this is when I had to teach it. I went through Bible college and seminary, and I never grasped this until I was forced to learn it in order to teach it. So 77s. And I believe that sevens means 70 periods of seven years each. So simply put, another way for us to paraphrase this is that Gabriel is telling Daniel, 490 years are determined for your people, the Jewish people, and for your holy city, which is Jerusalem. And these are the things that will take place in those 490 years to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, as you know, it goes all the way through the, the 27th verse there in Daniel chapter 9. So, if you were not a part of the Daniel study... I want you to go back and at least listen to the messages about Daniel chapter 9. And I actually was going back uh, yesterday trying to find where they were because the, the chapters do not correspond to the message numbers or the sermon numbers. So I believe it may be somewhere around sermon 13 or 14 from the Daniel prophecy. I'm not sure. But it's imperative that you listen to that study or to someone else or to some book that we've given away that you have in your possession. Learn Gabriel's message to Daniel in Daniel 9 because if you don't grasp that, everything else kind of collapses and it leaves you in the dark. So write this down. God's plan for Israel is built on a 490-year timeline. And that's, that, I base that on 77s, 70 units of seven years each. Do the math on that. If we're right in interpreting it this way, that's 490 years. Then I want you to note this, that from a decree that was made in Daniel's time for the Jewish people to go back to their homeland until the triumphal entry of Jesus there were 483 years. So shortly after Gabriel's prophetic revelation to Daniel, 
the clock started ticking on the 77s, the 490 years. And someone has calculated this, that literally on the day that Jesus rode into the holy city on Palm Sunday, that is when God pressed pause on the 490-year timeline, but he pressed pause with seven years remaining. 483 years had passed. And why would God press pause? Because the final week of Jesus' life when he rode into the holy city is when the Jewish people expressed the height of their rejection of him as their Messiah and ultimately cried out for his crucifixion. So God pressed pause on his program for the Jewish people when, as John's gospel begins, he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. And Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead, went back to heaven, and in the year 70 AD, the Romans completely obliterated Jerusalem, wiped Israel out as an entity, and the Jewish people as a national entity were wiped into oblivion until the middle of the 20th century. So God's finger was on the pause button from the time that Christ rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we believe his finger is still on the pause button when it comes to that last seven-year period completing the 490-year program that was revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. What happened when God pressed pause on his program for Israel in Christ's culminating death on the cross is that God shifted his focus from Israel to a different program of a global ingathering of Jews, but also of all the nations of the earth as the gospel message of the Messiah is preached in all the world, the ingathering of those who receive that message constitute the program of the church. And that's the period of time in which you and I are living today. So this means that with God's finger still on the pause button for Israel's prophetic fulfillment, all that God had in their program, God is actively building his church in these latter times. And there's going to come a time when God shifts his focus from the church because he will take the church out of the picture, removing them from the earth. Then God will push play and the last seven years to complete the 490-year program Gabriel revealed to Daniel will resume bringing the 490 years to its fulfillment. So hopefully this is crystallizing more just hearing me talk about it tonight since we've been studying this for so long. So just to remind you, in a 490-year program for the Jewish people, 483 years were completed from when the exiles in Babylon started returning to the Holy Land. And there are seven years outstanding to make up the difference between 483 years and 490. And we're going to see what those seven years are in just a moment. So that's why we're going to transition now to the book of Revelation. Now there are several interpretive foundations for, for understanding the book of Revelation. And I want to just review some of them for you. First of all, I believe that Revelation makes no sense unless you understand it as referring primarily to events that have not taken place. There are many people who interpret Revelation as referring to either past events that have already been fulfilled, or some of them interpret it as some type of allegory. Through signs and symbols, it is just presenting a, a story of symbols about the conflict between God and Satan, and God wins in the end. But there is no lingering future fulfillment of anything in a literal way. 
I believe that unless you adopt what we call a futuristic understanding of Revelation, meaning that it is referring to literal events, even though depicted in signs and symbols and images that may not be literal in and of themselves, those images and symbols, they depict literal personalities and events that will take place. So if Revelation is to be rightly understood, I believe you must see it through futuristic terms. It is a book about future events. Not only this, but I believe in order to make sense of Revelation, we must see most of what it talks about as being the fulfillment of that 70th seven in the 490-year program Gabriel revealed to Daniel. So Daniel 9 as the foundation or the key unlocks our door to understanding that most of what the book of Revelation is about, which is the tribulation of seven years, that is the last seven years of God's program for the Jewish people. Another foundation for interpreting Revelation is that when you read it, you have to acknowledge that implicit in the message of Revelation is God's plan to restore Israel to his kingdom. That I believe you are completely missing the point of Revelation unless you see Israel in Revelation. Unless you see all of the outstanding promises God made to them in his covenants of the Old Testament. There are so many of those promises that were never fulfilled by God that were not fulfilled by Jesus when he came the first time, but which will only be fulfilled in the last days. And it means if God leaves those promises without being fulfilled, it makes God less than reliable and less than honest, neither of which is a possibility. So God, if you want to put it in the sense of obligating himself to his own character, God still owes Israel the fulfillment to promises he swore to fulfill on their behalf. And I believe that the only way to rightly understand the book of Revelation is to see the book of Revelation as depicting not only all that we as Christians can anticipate in the millennium when we reign with Christ on the earth and most of all in the New Jerusalem, our eternal home, but I believe that the book of Revelation is where God checks off every box that has been left unchecked from the promises he made to them in their sacred writings and in the covenants of the Old Testament. That being said, you say, well, I can't find that literally written in the pages of, of Revelation. Well, you can certainly infer very logically that Israel is, is, is a vital part, I would call them an indispensable part, of the events of Revelation and of our ability to rightly interpret it. Second only to the book of Hebrews and our New Testament, the book of Revelation is the most Old Testament-saturated book of our New Testament. Um, one of the most fascinating things to me about the book of Revelation is to see just how many references to the Old Testament, indirect quotes from the Old Testament. Sometimes we call them allusions, A-L-L, -L, alluding to the Old Testament. It is replete. I mean, it is filled to the overflow with Old Testament content, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And therefore, it must have to do with the Jewish people and with Israel. Then I believe another interpretive foundation is understanding the land of Israel, the promised land, we call it the holy land, as the epicenter of prophetic fulfillment. It is not just the Jewish people. If you go back to Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, the covenants God made with Abraham it was one covenant, but he restated it several times. And then he renewed it with Isaac, and he renewed it yet again with Jacob. 
the covenant was not just that the descendants of Abraham would be God's people, but that God prescribed geographical boundaries. God promised them real estate. So it was not only the people of God, but it was the land God pledged to give them as their promised inheritance. And it is only by recognizing Israel as the epicenter of Bible prophecy that any prophecy makes sense, but certainly that revelation makes sense. So in order for revelation to be fulfilled, the Jewish people must return to the promised land. And they've been doing that for many years now, and they, they were reborn as a nation uh, back in the middle of the 20th century, as we all know. So that was a, a very important piece a biblical prophecy coming to pass because God had promised to regather them from the nations into which he had scattered them. And if they had not come back together in the providence of God, been reborn as a nation in the providence of God, then there would have been one of those lingering unchecked boxes where God said, I'm going to promise to bring you back and reconstitute you as my people. If God hadn't done that, then he would be less than, re less than reliable and less than honest. Not only this, but we have to recognize that the Antichrist is going to seek their complete annihilation. That little horn from among the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7 and the beast revealed in Revelation 13. Antichrist, same personality, depicted prophetically to Daniel and then to the, the Apostle John, he will seek to completely annihilate the Jewish people in the last days, in the middle of the tribulation period. Not only this, but the Messiah is going to return to the Jewish people in the promised land to which God has called them, and where they are now, and to which they are continuing to return. Not only that, but the nations of the earth will be crushed forever in the promised land. And that is an event called Armageddon, where Christ is going to come back and all of the na nations in the global alliance under the deception of Satan and the Antichrist will have been lured, and the Bible even says, drawn by God with hooks in their jaws into the valley of Megiddo, the plain of Armageddon, and it's going to transcend even that spot. It's going to reach probably 200 miles north and south where this global gathering of the armies of the nations of the world will be drawn to aim their weaponry at hopeless, helpless, defenseless Israel. And it will seem to be their end. And then Christ will appear from the clouds and come and rescue and deliver them. And all of those global nations and their military forces will be crushed in the promised land. That's what we've already seen in the book of Revelation. And after that crushing, which is the battle of Armageddon in which Christ is the conqueror, Christ secures and delivers the crushing blow of defeat to these satanically inspired nations who had aimed their wrath against Israel. He will then raise the flag of his messianic kingship over the city of Jerusalem, and he will rule from Jerusalem over all the earth for 1,000 years, which is what we call the millennium. And then at the conclusion of the 1,000 years, John saw, depicted in Revelation, that we will enter eternity forever separated from Satan, all evil, and all ungodly people. We will live in a place of utter perfection, of perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect love, perfect oneness, and never again will there be sadness, sorrow, sickness, or departure. All, that, all of the former things of our life of pain, misery, and sin will be purged from our memories. And that's in the city called the New Jerusalem. And then you know the prevailing theme of the book of Revelation, 
is not events that are going to happen. Israel, Antichrist, Christians, the church, the rapture, the return, the millennium. The prevailing theme is the glory of Jesus Christ. That he is the Lamb of God who is worthy to be praised forever, which is what we will do before his throne through the unending unfolding of eternal time. <laughs> okay, so I've prepared just an overview of the book of Revelation uh, depicted in images in, this, in, in, a, in a, what will look like a PowerPoint presentation when you see it. But I want to start with the verse that we've identified as providing us with an outline for dividing the book of Revelation, to breaking it down. And it was given to John in the first chapter of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19. And as you see there on the screen, John was told to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. And then I have broken it down. Those three statements are the three divisions of the outline of Revelation. The things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. So now what I want to do is to walk through just a visual of this outline of consisting of those three points revealed in chapter 1 and verse 19 of the book of Revelation. So uh, on the screen, you'll notice there's just a line, and that is going to be the line of what we're calling the Revelation panorama. And now we're going to come back, and one section at a time, we're going to fill in each of those three sections that were revealed in chapter 1 and verse 19. So we believe that just as the outline was revealed to John in chapter 1. So chapter 1 actually constitutes the first section, and that is the things which you have seen. And you'll see there what John had seen was Jesus Christ in heaven. And we've borrowed this image uh, from online, but it shows Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, and he is in the midst of the lampstands, if you can see them. And there were seven lampstands, and those seven lampstands symbolized seven specific churches to whom Jesus was going to communicate through a letter to each church that would be given to John, written down, and then delivered to these churches. So chapter 1 is section 1, all right? The next section, section 2, is chapters 2 and 3. That is, the things which are. And chapters 2 and 3 contain these letters to the seven churches, which I mentioned. And we uh, actually devoted one sermon to each letter to those churches. So it took us seven weeks to talk about that when we talked about it. But I want you to notice under that it says the church age. Those were seven literal churches in geographical cities in the time when John received the revelation. But we also believe that those seven churches symbolize the age of the church. And the church age began when the church was born on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And the church age will end when the church is raptured. Now I want to just pause for a moment because if you'll remember when, when God pressed pause on his program for Israel when Jesus rode into the city or, or sometime thereabout when he died on the cross, God pressed pause 483 years had passed, and then God shifted to a new program for the ingathering of the church. Well, the official inauguration of God's program for the church is Acts chapter 2. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the church was officially birthed in a spiritual sense. And we are now 2,000 years removed from that time but from Pentecost until the rapture, that period of time is the church age, and it's the period of time 
uh, that, that the prophets of the Old Testament could not see. That's why in the book of Ephesians, Paul calls the church a mystery because no one saw God's program for the church becoming a reality. But God knew it, of course, before time began. So just wanting you to realize the letters to the churches were actual letters to actual churches, but symbolically they depict the things which are. And when John was receiving this, this of course was on the front end in the first century of the church age, and we are now uh, 2,000 years removed from that time. How much longer will the church age last? Um, we don't really know. But what will end the church age, it's very important for you to, to, to hear this, it is not the return of Christ, it is the appearing of Christ. And when Christ appears, that's when the church, and I want you to notice on the screen, Christ appearing and the church will go up, and we call that the rapture. And this is when Christ appears, the trumpet sounds, and the church is taken up to heaven away from the earth. All right? And so then the church age officially is over. This is when, after the rapture, church age ends, God shifts his focus back, pushes play, and that last seven years resumes to fulfill the 490-year program that Gabriel revealed to Daniel back in Daniel chapter 9. And this brings us to our third section that was revealed in chapter 1 and verse 19, which is the things which will take place after these things, which is chapters 4 through 22. All right? And as you can see, it is that last section that comprises the bulk of the book of Revelation. And these are things that concern the future, chapters 4 through 22. Now, one of the things we immediately see in chapters 4 and 5, is the centrality and the focus being on God's throne in heaven. And if you'll remember when we looked at the Daniel slide and, and, and we saw the warrior image, there was a throne that was at the top and in the center of the screen. And so it is here. That throne is in the center because John constantly refers back to the activity of praise and worship around the throne of God, no matter what is going on down on earth below. God's throne. And what a great reminder this is to us. God's throne is central in the book of Daniel. It is central in the book of Revelation. And it is for us to remember that we are never, ever, ever to be distracted from the sovereignty of God the power of God, the providence of God, God's omnipotence. He is seated in and enthroned above all that happens here on earth. And so God's throne in heaven, always our attention gets drawn back to that. Then what I want you to see is that beginning in chapter 6, you will see the tribulation period of, of seven years. And that seven-year tribulation depicted there, that is that last seven-year installment on the 490 years. And do you know how the tribulation was revealed to John? It was revealed in a series of three sevens. Seven seals were broken that held the scroll bound, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. The seals, the trumpets, the bowls, they comprise the seven-year tribulation. And we talked at length about each of the judgments that followed, whether it was the breaking of a seal and a judgment that followed, or the sounding of a trumpet and the judgment that followed, or the pouring out of a bowl and the judgment that followed. So you have these successive stages of judgment that compound throughout the tribulation period. And I thought that you would just notice down below the seven-year tribulation that this is Israel's 70th week from Daniel 9. It is the time when the Antichrist will rule, and it is a time when he will rule and have under his dominion the global alliance of nations. And we talked about this 
John had it revealed to him in that the, the kingdom of the Antichrist had a code name attached to it in Revelation, and that was Babylon. And that is because Babylon to the Jewish people represented all that was blasphemous, all that was cruel, all that was barbarous. Going all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's time, who desecrated and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and brought the Jews out as captives and exiles, Babylon is a nasty word in the Jewish vocabulary. And it's just interesting that, that when God is revealing the kingdom of the Antichrist to John, it is described as Babylon, which is a term that a Jew like John, now a Christian, would certainly be able to identify with. And notice under that there is political Babylon, there is religious Babylon. So the kingdom of the Antichrist has a political component, but it also has a religious com component. Then I want you to notice this idea of the unholy trinity. The unholy trinity, just as God is a holy trinity, so there is an unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, who is his human incarnation, whose number is 666 according to the book of Revelation, and the false prophet who will be the religious leader of this what we call a church of Babylon, if you will, this end times one world religion that will be used to draw people into the worship of the Antichrist. So there you have the unholy trinity. Now just so you know, according to Daniel 9, in the middle of that 70th seven, which we are interpreting as the tribulation of seven years, in the middle of that week or that seven years, which would be three and a half is half of seven. In the middle of the seven years, which is at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist who will have made a treaty with Israel to be their defender, their advocate, their ally with all the resources at his disposal as he's drawn these nations and their resources into his web, he will have promised them peace and protection, but in the halfway point, Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel 9 that he's going to break the treaty and turn on Israel. And that's what I've depicted here in the visual. Israel is betrayed. And you'll see the scissors denote that uh, that's a symbol that he, he cuts the treaty. He tears the treaty up by betraying the people of Israel, although he had promised to be their defender and their advocate. And when we think about all that he's going to do, and Jesus even talked about this in Matthew chapter 24, he made it clear that it is that last half of the tribulation, which we call the great tribulation, after the treaty with Israel is broken, the Antichrist is going to turn and he's going to summon those nations who are loyal to him to turn their wrath and vengeance against the people of Israel in those last three and a half years, which we call the Great Tribulation. All right, and then it's going to seem as though all of the nations of the earth, as the end of the seven years approaches, uh, all the nations of the earth are going to gather and they're going to appear to wipe Israel into extinction. And that is when Christ is going to return with his saints to the earth. And even though he is shown in a white robe with, with a red sash, and, and he's not on the back of a horse, when John saw him, as you know, in Revelation 19, he was on the back of a white horse. But you know this is the same moment that I'm depicting here on this timeline. Christ comes back. And you'll notice there that Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon takes place. And I want you to notice what happens at the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus returns with his saints. He rescues Israel and consumes the armies of the Antichrist. And he establishes his millennial kingdom in Jerusalem. And that's where I want you to see that flag of David, the Israeli flag, because that symbolizes when the people of Israel will finally be restored into the kingdom of God because having rejected their Messiah the first time, their population will have been 
reduced by such numbers that the remnant left at the conclusion of the Antichrist's wrath in those last three and a half years, the remnant left, they're going to be so desperate. They're going to realize that, that their future is grim and that the outlook is sure to be their final extermination. And in this desperation, having been nearly purged from existence, Christ is going to appear. And that's why Paul says in Romans 9 and 10 and 11, he says, all Israel will be saved. He is referring to a whittled down remnant that are going to embrace Jesus when he returns. And from his return, Israel will enthrone him in the capital city and we will come back with him and there will be a 1,000 year period of his reign on the earth and that's what we call the millennium or the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then it is at the conclusion of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ that all of the unsaved dead are going to be resurrected and will stand before the great white throne judgment, which is a terrible scene John saw in the book of Revelation. And after their deeds are read from the books of sin and they are sentenced to their eternal fate in hell, John describes for us the new Jerusalem coming down from God as the eternal habitation of all of God's people. And that's when eternity begins. John sees this holy city, and it is where we will go to live forever and ever and ever and ever. And so there you have it. That is an outline of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to leave that up in case you want to just take a shot of that with your phone. Or remember, this will be in the archives for you to, to go and look at again. But I sure hope that by going back and doing an overview of Daniel and then an overview of Revelation with some interpretive keys as well as this timeline in pictures, I hope that this has been one last installment worth viewing, listening to tonight to help solidify and confirm in your heart what we've talked about, and what I believe is the accurate interpretation of Bible prophecy from these two books of the Bible that we've spent the last year focusing on. Well, thank you for watching tonight. I look forward to seeing those of you who will be with us uh, on Easter Sunday. I look forward to sharing communion with those of you who will be watching online on Good Friday night. And let's, as always, remember that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God whose blood was shed to take away the sins of the world, and that includes your sin and my sin. And forever and ever and ever, He is worthy of our praise. Father, thank You for allowing us to study tonight as well as all year long. And in a time of darkness during this pandemic, my faith has been bolstered and strengthened because of teaching and studying and preparing these messages. And I just thank you for the gift that this past year of, of prophecy study has been from you to my own heart and how I pray it has had the same effect in the hearts and lives of everyone who has watched it and who's been part of this journey. We love you and thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.